This is a time in our service where we read scripture together. It which unifies us. It, it, it helps us remember that uh, all, of, all of God's word is true. And so by speaking it together, uh, we bring truth here. We worship in spirit and truth. I did want to, today is a little different in that the, I chose the scripture not based on what I was preaching, but based on what's going on in our world today. So we know that there's war uh, and rumors of wars everywhere, but specifically with Israel and, and within what's going on there. And, and a lot of times Christians I know would ask, uh, it, it was talked about much more when, we were young, when I was younger. I say we, some of you weren't even born when I was younger. But um, born when I was younger, that, that Israel was kind of, we understood that there was something that the Bible said about Israel that had us uh, before Israel. And, and it's true, in, in, um, when Abraham was told by God that the peop his people would be through Abraham, he said, those who bless you will be blessed and those who curse you will be cursed. And, that, and we understand that specifically it was through Abraham and the people of Israel that God um, chose as the people to bring about eventually the Messiah and salvation. It was through his, that root. And that all of us who are Gentiles, and there might be some Jews here, but all the rest of us who are Gentiles, that, that we come to God being grafted into the tree of Abraham. And, and, and it's by Christ, but it's into the tree that was the original root. And so it's hard for us because the fact of the matter is, you know, Israel, the country, isn't completely, you know, right in everything they do. And, and at the same time, God says that we should support those people. So um, this morning as we read, I wanted you to read in God's word where this part of this is found. And it's found in Romans chapter 11, verses 17 through 18. And Paul says this. Will you read this with me? But some of these branches from Abraham's tree, some of the people of Israel have been broken off. And you Gentiles, who were branches from a wild olive tree, have been grafted in. So now you also receive the blessing God has promised Abraham and his children, sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. But you must not brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. You are just a branch, not the root. Father, we come in a time like this where there's so much going on in our world, but especially with Israel and your people of your promised land. And God, we recognize that um, we are all broken and nothing Israel does is perfect, and yet we also know that um, your people have been um, abused and mocked and taken advantage of, and Father, the promise from the very beginning that, that those who bless Abraham will be blessed and those who curse will be cursed. And Lord, as part of Abraham's tree now, Father, we want to say yes and amen to protecting them. Lord, we know right now many of them, most of them are in rebellion to you. You tell us that. But even in the midst of that, you tell us your great plan is that most of them at one day will come and know you. So, Father, we pray for that sooner rather than later, for we know that that'll be part of the end. Lord, I pray for protection for all the innocents. God, all those children and, and God, those who, who might even be believing lies and, and Satan will use for his purposes, Lord, I pray that you will reveal the truth. And God, I pray today, though, as we worship, that we'll understand that we must worship you in spirit and truth. Lord, I pray that as we sing, that we will sing and worship in fullness of who we are to you. That, God, true worship is not graded by whether we like the, the song, the message, uh, anything else today. But, God, it is all about you. So, Father, may you be pleased. And that is our earnest prayer today. And we ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Well, let's stand this morning, and we're going to rattle some dry bones this morning.
was dry bones or our bones, but not anymore. For those that have believed in Christ, we can walk in the newness of life and the resurrection of life in Christ. Amen.
25 and 26 says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And he asked this question to all of us today. Do you believe this? We do, amen. Amen.
Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one who guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Father, we just come before you today, Father, with thankful hearts. We thank you, Father, for your love and because you are so good, Father. Lord, today, I need you. We need you. With all we see happening around us today in this world, and even regardless whether it's just with our own personal emotions or circumstances or the things we see in the culture today that contrary to you and to your word. Father, I just ask that we just step back and be silent and still our hearts and just focus on you and ask for your Holy Spirit to work within us, Father, that we would come to know your will for us and that we would move on that will that you have for us, Father, because no matter what it is that you give us, you will never have us fail because you will provide everything that we need to accomplish what you ask us to do. Lord, I just pray for Pastor Daniel today. Father, I just pray that all eyes and ears and hearts, Father, would focus on him and the message from the absolute truth of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. This morning we're in our, our second part of our new series called Living Faith. And if you were watching with us live, and hopefully it's live, because last week we thought it was live and it wasn't live, um, we, we did record and you can go back and watch last week's uh, service now. So um, if you don't want to watch this one live, you can watch and come back, whatever you want to do. But 
Um, if you were not with us, we want to encourage you to catch up because last week was the beginning and it laid the foundation for the series because it talked about really four principles that were necessary for faith. Now, we know that in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it is declared that without faith, it is what? Impossible to please God. I mean, that's huge, right? That without faith, it is impossible to please God. No way, no how, no matter what I do, even if I do the right thing, if I don't do it in faith, it doesn't please God. And so we talked about the foundational principles of all kinds of faith. You know, we use faith in so many different way, ways. Christianese, we talk faith this, faith that. You know, we might mean uh, faith as in salvation. We might mean faith as in, you know, what we need in prayer. We talk about faith in so many different ways. But the underlying foundation of those are the same. And we talked last week, it starts with humility. We don't often, you know, consider humility an important part of faith. But humility is absolutely necessary. And we talked about that trust in God's power, trust in God's uh, in his authority and trust in his sovereignty in all things were necessary when we talk about faith. And so as we move on, we, we talk about a living faith. And in reality, it's the idea that faith isn't just something you do one time. Like we, we might think, you know, you, you think about like Peter getting out of the boat and, you, and it was an act of faith. But the fact of the matter is, living faith, faith that's true, the kind of faith that God calls us to is trust. Trust in Him no matter what's going on. Trust, trust in Him no matter where we are in our life. It is not a one-time action for a one-time thing. It is a faith that grows because as we grow in Christ, as we move forward in this life, our faith has to grow or else we have problems, right? Some of us at times have outlived in some ways our faith and it's cost us. Not, not, once again, not saying salvation faith, but the kind of faith that, that pleases God in all things. We can move in our life and, and take steps and in the end, stop with the faith. Stop trusting God in that area. And so this morning, we want to talk about, in the, in the next four weeks, but this morning we want to talk one specific area that, that we need to have faith when it comes to living faith. And that is faith to communicate with God. Faith to communicate with God. Now, here's what's interesting. We always talk about relationship with God, right? That through faith, we come through Christ into salvation, and then we have relationship with God. But really, without communication, there is no relationship, right, ladies? Say that to your husbands. Without communication, there's really no relationship. Now, some of you are like, well, my husband says he has a bunch of friends and I watch them on, you know, on the couch on Saturday as they root somebody on and they don't say nothing and they say they have a relationship. Oh, trust me, they communicate. It's just like, yeah, or oh. You know, you don't have to say a lot of words to communicate. But the fact of the matter is communication is absolutely essential to relationships. So when we say we have a relationship with God, we have to understand that that also means that God wants to communicate with us. God wants to communicate with us. We're going to start this morning in Job chapter 33, 14. And we read this. Hopefully. Maybe. Perhaps. Oh, there we are. For, for God does speak. Now one way, now another, though no one perceives it. Another translation puts it this way. For God speaks again and again, though people do not recognize it. God speaks again and again, though people do not recognize it. So this week, I decided that I was going to reseed my lawn. Now, I'm from Texas, and I don't believe rocks should be the only part of your lawn. Okay, so I wanted a piece of grass, and, and every winter, I wait until I see people who know something to reseed their lawn, and then I follow, right? And so I've, I went out, and I got some manure stuff, so our front lawn smells really good. You can smell it from like four houses away. Um, and then I put seeds in, whatever, but there's a problem. Once the seeds go down, the birds decide to eat my grass seed. Now, the good news should be... Then I have two dogs. 
And, and so, unfortunately, my dogs aren't useful breeds. You know, some people have like retrievers and things that would, you know, keep the birds away. No, I have a multi poo who's 12 pounds, and I have a woodle, which is a Wheaton Terrier poodle, and he's 45 pounds, but he's literally the dumbest dog that God ever created. Awesomely fun, but not very smart. Well, I decided, you know what I need to do? I sit on the porch a lot. I'm just going to let my dogs come out there, and they'll take care of these birds. And so, you know, uh, normally with my dogs, I've already taught them, or didn't really have to teach them, but they would go after lizards and stuff, and so I'd say things like, go get them. And they immediately go underneath, you know, and try to get the lizards out. Even if there aren't lizards, they just assume that I saw one because they're not very good hunters. So they're looking, and they're trying to find the lizard. And, and so I was trying to teach them, now when I say go get them, I mean the birds, right? So I would, I would uh, you know, the birds would land, and I'd kind of go, go get them. And I'd kind of lead them out and point them, and the dogs would look at me, and then they'd go to the next bush and look for a lizard. And I mean, I was trying, I, you know, I, I got to the point where, like, I picked Tex, my multi-poo up, and, and the birds were getting there. I snuck up, and I kind of threw them into the grass, and, and they all spread. But he was like, I don't know what you're doing, dude. What do you want me to do? Communicate better. Unfortunately, I could not communicate to either one of those dogs what I wanted them to get done. And a lot of times, God wants to communicate with us, but we're not really good on picking up what he's trying to say. And so this morning, I, wanna, I want us to understand that God truly wants to communicate with us. That in faith, we're going to trust because the Bible says so, that God wants to communicate. And if we're going to take that step of faith, that means, guess what? we got to have active participation in speaking and listening and communicating with God. In order to see this, though, and how God communicates, I feel like we could easily go to Exodus chapter 19 and 20 and 23. Now, I'm just going to summarize where we are because some of you probably aren't you know, as maybe knowledgeable about the Bible. So what has happened is that all the people of Israel were in Egypt. Now Abraham, we talked about this morning, Abraham was originally the man God called in, in Abraham's faith and said, hey, I want you to be the one I bless this world through. And you're going to have descendants that number the sand and the stars in the sky. And so Abraham... And then Isaac was his son, and then Jacob was his son, and Joseph was Jacob's son. And Joseph got sold to slavery, and then through God's incredible um, just might, he becomes the second in charge. And he brings all of his family, Jacob and all his other brothers, to Egypt. And over the course of 400 years, there are 2 million people now. And what happened was the Egyptians looked and like, man, God's... Well, they didn't say God, but they're like, man, those people are outgrowing us. We need to do something about it. So they enslaved them. And his people cried out to God, and God sent Moses, who was himself originally a murderer, by the way, because he thought he was going to get it done on his own, sent Moses to go and be a prophet for God and release the people. And so what happened is through the plagues, maybe you've heard of the, you know, the, uh, the ten plagues, you've watched the Ten Commandments movie or whatever it is, but, but these ten plagues that came, eventually the Egyptians let them go. And they went to the wilderness and they got to the point where they got hungry and God provided manna, which was stuff that just showed up on the ground every morning. And they got thirsty and God gave them water from a rock. And, and God was providing for them in every way. And they get to this mountain, Mount Sinai. And now God is going to speak to his people. He's going to tell them his expectations. He's going to speak to them. And, and so the first thing that he does is we read in uh, Exodus 19, verse 3 and 4. It says, Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. 
The first way that God speaks to us is through his acts of kindness and mercy. In fact, we're told in Romans 1 that the very nature that we stare at and we look at declares who God is. It is God speaking to each of us saying, I am. I am. This didn't happen by accident. This didn't happen by, you know, pure, you know, just this idea that it just showed up. I mean, even scientists, if you were to ever actually look at it and try to understand it, you know, we, we kind of, oh, school said it was evolution. Even scientists would say this, well, it came out of nothing, and we don't know how. It, it, I mean, they try to declare, you know, but they can't tell you where the nothing came from that, you know, the something came from that it was made from. So God says, I took nothing and created something, and by that alone, I speak to you. I speak my greatness. When you go outside and you look at what God's done, you, you take a breath, guess what? That's God speaking to you. He told the people of Israel, the very fact you're here at this mountain right now should tell you, I'm great. I'm who I said I am. I said I was going to take care of you. I said I was going to call you out. I have. So the way God often speaks to us are his acts. By the way, this in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, you know how God spoke to us? His name was Jesus Christ. The very fact of who Jesus is speaks to us. Remember what John says at the very beginning of his gospel? He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was what? Was God. That's describing Jesus Christ. And the very act of Jesus, of God sending his Son to earth, spoke something to everyone, to all of us. It said, I love you. Remember what John 3.16 says? For God so what? Loved the world that he did what? Gave his one and only son. The fact of the matter, the acts of God, what God does, spoke directly from Jesus said, I love you, I have mercy on you, I have grace on you. Through Jesus I can declare you holy. Through Jesus, put your faith in him, I can declare you right with me. We can have a relationship. We can communicate. So just as in the Old Testament, his acts showed up, and that's how he often spoke to people, even now he speaks to us through his acts. The second thing, the second way he spoke to his people then, in Exodus 19, 9, we read this. And the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. And then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. Now, here's the thing. Moses was one of the prophets. How God often spoke to his people in the Old Testament was through prophets. He would call, his spirit would come upon prophets or he would speak directly to prophets and say, go speak this to my people. Now, here's the one time in the Old Testament where God actually says, I'm going to speak out loud to everyone. Now, there's going to be two million people. And, and Moses was told to tell them, you prepare. It was a three-day, get right, make sure you're ready. And we're all going to come to a certain place around this mountain. Now, here's the thing. God said, lay out a, a perimeter. They're not supposed to come any closer because I'm holy. And so they get there. And what's interesting is the people look, and you know what's going on in the mountain? Mountain's on fire. Mountain's full of smoke. God's presence comes down. And now you, you know, some of us would go, oh, that'd be so cool. That'd be so awesome. You know, m most of us think that God, the first thing that we read about the, um, the Ten Commandments, we think of it as on stone. But in Exodus 20, the original Ten Commandments were first spoken to the people. They heard God speak. And, and through that, you know what the people did? We would think, oh, that'd be so awesome if I could hear from God and just make it life so much easier. How many of you think if you could just hear God speak, life would be so much easier as far as communication? Yeah, some of you, some of you are like, I don't know. It, it, I mean, honestly, that would seem easy, right? But you know what these two million people thought? Don't do that again. You know why? Because when the presence of God came that heavy, it was fearsome. Have you ever been somewhere 
maybe alone or, or in a service or something when the presence of God came heavy. I mean, it's awesome, but it's also fearsome. And so, you know, Moses is standing there and Moses has been talking to God forever. And Moses has, probably has this big smile on his face as God's given them these commandments. But we're, we read the people go to Moses afterward and they're like, hey, Moses, how about this? We don't do that again. You just go get God's commands and then come and tell me later. I think sometimes that's us. We think we want to hear from God, but because of the, the idea that maybe it's easier if somebody else could just tell me what God says. I mean, you go, well, isn't that why I come to church? No, you do not. That's not why you come to church. Yes, God still speaks through people. God still speaks through pastors and teachers and, 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 and even the people sitting next to you. He'll still speak through them. But you know what? He wants to speak to you directly now. He wants you to hear from him. The third way he speaks is he speaks in the written word. We read after this um, that it says that God actually, you know, wrote the Ten Commandments on stone. That way they could know not only what they heard, it's what they saw, right? Except for the first, the first pieces of stone got broke because while Moses was up there getting them, the people had already turned away from God and decided to make some golden calves and worship them. Now, I know as a kid I used to read that and go, man, how stupid are those? And now, after 50 years, I go, I'm a lot like them. You ever felt that where, you know, you hear from God and then a week later you're like, eh, am I sure? Was that really God? And the fact is, is, is they, they had it written down. And that's why our scriptures are so important. You know what Hebrews says about the word of God? That it's active and, and living. That it's not just like a novel you read from front to back and go, I'm done. I think some of us, you know, we've heard all of those sermons. We've, we've read through the Bible and we think, well, I'm good. But the fact of the matter is the reason why God declares it living and active is because it still speaks to you today as it did before. It still has something about your life. And we know where's that come from. And that's the last thing is the Holy Spirit. In, in Exodus chapter 23, 21, or 20 through 21, the other way they received messages in the Old Testament was through messengers, angels. In particular, in this way, we see the pre-incarnate Christ, which means Jesus before he came in body. Because God says this, See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared Pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion since my name is in him. My name is in him is the key. This is the pre-incarnate Christ. This is the messenger. In the Old Testament, every once in a while, you'd see angels show up. Not necessarily just the pre-incarnate Christ. But you would see angels show up and they would give messages directly to certain people. But here's the advantage that we have since Christ, we don't need a messenger to come. We have a messenger that lives in us. The very Holy Spirit, the third part of the Trinity, it says in Scripture, it says in Ephesians 1.13, it says basically, if you believe, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. By the way, that's what helps make the Word of God living and active because the one who wrote it, it says that through men, the Spirit breathed and they wrote. The same one who wrote it is the same one who transcribes it to your heart and your mind. We don't need necessarily angels to come. You know why? Because we have the very Spirit of God living in us. If you're a believer, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, He speaks. He speaks. Do you know even today, right now, God wants to speak with you. There's never a time that God does not want to speak with you. you remember, we read in 1 Thessalonians, it says, what? Pray without what? Ceasing. Pray without ceasing. And sometimes we, we look and we go, does that mean I'm always like, every, you know, even when I'm driving or whatever, I've got to be praying, I've got to be praying. 
to understand what that word prayer means, you got to break it down. And basically, uh, it, it's two words. And the first word in Greek means toward with an, with an idea of, of interaction. And the second word is that we kind of say pray is really ex- ask or wish or de- show desires. And, and together it means an exchange of desires. Meaning we exchange our desires for God's desires. We're interacting with Him. And we're supposed to be doing that how often? All the time. That as I go throughout the day, when something comes to my heart and mind, I speak it to the Lord. I'm always with my mind and my heart thinking, God might have something to say now. You know, we can go, and, and man, I, I'm just going to be honest, there, there have been days I get so busy doing God's stuff, I'm not sure I've communicated with God the whole time. I, I, you know, I, maybe I got directions at the beginning of the day when I spent time, but the rest of the day I got so busy, I couldn't hear. Have you ever been there? So busy, you can't hear. You know, I, I laugh because <laughs> my wife says that, uh, that I'm a selective listener. And I thought, you know, well, that... That sounds like a, you know, a good thing. I selectively listen. And then she rolls her eyes. Because that's not a good thing, man. We, we are so proud sometimes to be a selective. I know my father-in-law was kind of proud to be a selective listener. But you know what a selective listener means? It's like I'm on my computer and, I, and the game's playing in the back. I'm reading something on my phone and my wife's talking to me. Now here's the thing. I can only pay attention to one of those three. Right? And so, you know, I'm good at going, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, uh uh-huh. And then I find out later I said I was going to do something that I never did. You know, if she, you know, she's here right now. If she really wanted to do me in, she'd just be telling me all the time, well, you said you would do this. And I'd have to go, I forgot, you know, I didn't know. Because the reality is, is I'm a selective listener. You know what? That's us with God. We're selective listeners. We listen to all other things. We'll turn on news, and that'll get us going. We'll get angry. We'll get mad. We'll turn on news. We'll read things. We'll watch sports or, or you know, do things that we just really enjoy doing, which isn't bad. But we're not listening at all. In the midst of it, we're interacting with people, and yet we're never, we're never thinking with the idea that, would God have something to say to me? to say to them, or God have something to say to me, just me. God wants to speak to you even now. And hopefully as I speak, you're hearing that God wants to interact with you all the time. Like, not not just like once a day in your quiet time. Like throughout the day as you live, we have to start beginning to, to listen and trust that He's speaking. It gets, I think for many of us, our our biggest issue is that we begin to look at God's word and the things that God has us do as duties and obligations. You know, I I look at my my wife, she's um, helping lead a Bible study. And I look at the book that they do, and that looks like homework. And homework isn't bad. Unless it becomes just something I'm trying to get done so I can show up to class and not look like I haven't done anything, right? It's so easy to begin to think that I get up in the morning and I read that chapter of of the Bible or I do whatever I do in the morning and really I'm not listening at all. I'm just trying to check it off and going, I did something for God. And the sad part is I look back and much of my life, I wasn't listening. I I didn't realize that God was ready to speak to me. I was just getting something done so I could check. Maybe even today, you're here because you're supposed to be here. Did you ever ask, as you came, did you say, God, I'm listening. 
You know, one of my favorite all-time stories is, is Samuel and Eli. And, and, and Samuel didn't know how to listen. And so God kept trying to talk to him, and Samuel just assumed that was Eli. And eventually Eli was like, oh, God's trying to talk to you. Okay, pretend I'm Eli today. <laughs> Can I tell you something? God's trying to speak to you. God, God doesn't always plan his speaking either. He doesn't go, I do it on Sundays from 1030 to 1130. Please be there. You know, I, I do it in your morning from 7 to 8. Please be there. God wants us to be ready to hear at all times. God wants us to exchange ideas at all times. And, and he tells us the importance of it because he says that our prayers, like when we're interacting with him, that that's like incense before him. Think about that. It's a sweet-smelling aroma. God likes to interact with his people. That it's not some distant relationship where he's like, you know what? We're good. Do good things. See you later. Man, God wants to grow us in hearing. You know, in the Old Testament, a couple of times it says this. And the word of God was rare. And what that meant at the time is there were no prophets, that God had not raised up any prophets. And back then, that's how he spoke mainly, as we talked about, to his people, was through prophets. And there were no prophets. But nowadays, that's not necessary. But how many of us here might say, I feel like the word of God has been rare to me. Like, I, I, I feel like I don't hear God like I once did. Or, or maybe, they, Pastor, as you, as you talk about this, I have to be honest, I don't hear that way. Like, I never hear God personally. Can I tell you something? He's speaking. He's speaking. You know, we, as, I, as we started in Job where it says, you know, he speaks again and again, but we don't recognize it. I can remember there was a time in my life where, I mean, chaos. Just so much stuff going on. And I felt like God wasn't speaking. And I kept praying, and I kept asking, and I kept saying, God, would you say peace be still over this? Would you say peace be still? Because that's what I was listening for. That's what I wanted to see. I wanted to see the chaos end. I wanted to see peace be still. And then finally, I listened a little different. And my father said this. And when I say that, I mean my heavenly father. He said, I don't want to speak peace be still. What I want to speak is peace in the storm. What I want to say is the storm is here. I've brought it. But I can still give you peace. I couldn't recognize his voice because I was listening for one thing. And I didn't want to hear anything else. That's where the humility comes in, folks. That's where the sovereignty comes in is to be able to say, God, whatever you want to tell me, tell me. Today, is that your heart? Whatever you want to tell me, tell me. This morning, as we close, I want to encourage you. <laughs> you know, God doesn't just say he speaks to us. He says we should speak to him. And the great news for you, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Paul declares this in Ephesians 3.12, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Did you hear that? I can come into his presence as an adopted son and daughter, and exchange desires. To speak, it's not just he wants to speak to us, he wants to speak with us. Today you have that opportunity. Will you take it? 
Will you ask God this morning, no matter what you have to say, God, I want to hear. Will you pray with me? Father, I want to hear. I want our people to hear. I want these people, your people, those who put their faith in Jesus Christ to hear. Lord, I pray that you will speak clearly. I pray that whatever might be guarding their heart, whatever fears they might have, that maybe there's a place in their life where they know that they're not living according to your way and they're afraid to step any closer and to listen. Lord, I pray that you will remind them that if we confess with our mouth, or that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, you make us holy. Lord, if there's someone here who's holding back from you because there's a place in their life, I pray right now they repent. That God, hearing from you is so much better than anything else this world offers. Lord, help us be active listeners. Lord, if there's someone here and they heard all of this and they don't understand because they've never put their faith in you, you tell us, Lord, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. I pray if there's someone here who has not ever heard that, that they hear that today. And Father, it's, if they've heard it a thousand times, that today will be the day they truly hear it. That you are speaking to them. They can be saved. But Father, may we not walk out today without hearing from you. And we ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. out to the Lord. Sing this out. Let your fire fall. Cast out all my fears. Ask the Lord right now. 
Let your fire fall, your love is all I feel. Let your fire fall and cast out all my fears. Let your fire fall, your love is all I feel. Oh, let your fire fall and cast out all my This morning, um, you saw that we had our, our baptistry, uh, otherwise known, oh, hopefully everyone survived, otherwise known as a horse trough with some stuff in it. But uh, we, we have a couple who are being baptized, so you can sit down. It, um, I appreciate you just spending a couple more minutes with us as um, John is going to come forward and, and Pat's going to uh, actually baptize him. Um, and then also the other John. Collins is coming forward as well. So, you know, the first thing the Bible tells us that once we're saved, the, the next step in obedience, it doesn't save us. It's not what saves us, but the step in obedience is to be baptized. And there's more than, it's more than just, it, it's one thing in that you see the whole act of salvation played out in that. Jesus died for us and then was rose again. And so we come and we say we want to be affiliated with that. We want to be a part of that. We're saying we're a part of the family and we're declaring it. But there's also something that God says happens in us through that that we receive. And so I want to um, make sure that if you're here today and you've made a decision to follow Christ, but you've never been baptized, maybe today's the day. Maybe that's what God wants to speak to your heart that you've held off and you know you should be up here. And if that's you, get in line, all right? But uh, just wanted to, as, as Pat and John come forward, and hopefully uh, I'll, I'll hold the microphone for you so you don't get electrocuted. I just want to say it's an honor to know John Bigelow, uh, just a faithful man of God who wants to make this public profession today. Many of you know John, just grafted right into our church, a faithful servant, loves God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. So we're just going to celebrate what Christ has done in John this morning. So John, come on in. Well, he's trying to get his shoe off. <laughs> go ahead. There you go. His sandals kind of look like Jesus' sandals. It's pretty cool. That was the idea. Yeah. John, anything you want to say to the church? I just want to thank everybody in this church for making this be home for me. It was a grand connection immediately. Amen. Thank you for making water look warm. <laughs> we did in a really important game of paper, rock, scissors, ice or no ice, and thankfully... The baptismal guys won, so. Well, John, have you made a public, have you made a profession that Jesus Christ is Lord? You believe in your heart that God rose him from the dead, John. Have you done that? Yes. Amen. Well, John, my brother in Christ, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, I baptize you. Buried with him in baptism. 
Raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Amen. And this is John Collins. John, you can start making your way in. Relatively new to the church and 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 relatively new to the faith. Just made his made his. Uh, Profession of faith in Jesus Christ as Lord, uh, pretty recently, God really got a hold of his heart. John, anything you want to say to the church? That uh, I felt very welcome coming in here, and uh, I just feel it's a good place. Amen. Well, John, do you confess Jesus Christ as Lord? Do you believe that God rose him from the dead? My brother in Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism. Raised to walk in newness of life, amen. Praise the Lord, amen. God, God redeems us and he saves us for a purpose and today hopefully we'll, we'll all be able to be more of an active listener to what his purpose is for you tomorrow. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you. We thank you that you not only save us, but you're not done with us. That God, you redeem us, you change us, you sanctify us, you grow us to look more like your son. You declare what's good is for us to be more like him. And so, Lord, as we walk this out this week, I pray that we will listen to what you have to say, even in the midst of the storm for some of us. That, God, you have us and you desire an interaction with us. You want to point us in different directions. You want to encourage us with your words from your scripture. Lord, may we be open today and this week more than in the past and say, God, speak. And we ask this in Jesus Christ's name and all of God's people said. If you can help with the the chairs, we do have to put them up this week. Have a great day and thank you for coming.